Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our chapter 10 muscle tissue chapter. We're going to continue on with talking about the uh, muscle tissue's ability to generate ATP. We talked about the three different ways that muscle tissue can generate ATP. We have our phosphagen system, which utilizes, you know, the myosin kinase, which transfers one phosphate from an ADP molecule to another ADP molecule to give us an ATP. And then we also have our creatine kinase, uh, which is going to take the phosphate molecule off of creatine phosphate, add it to an ADP molecule and give us an ATP. So that is one of the systems. We also have the process of glycolysis, which is going to be another way to generate ATP. And then of course we have our aerobic cellular respiration method, which utilizes the function of the mitochondria in generating a lot of ATP, all right, when we're discussing uh, different ways to generate ATP, we really prefer uh, the mitochondria to get involved with the use of oxygen because we get pretty much more bang for our buck. So if you notice here, when we're going and talking about the glucose molecule, um, when it gets broken down, uh, we wind up through the process of glycolysis, pyruvate. It's an intermediate. Now, if oxygen is present, wonderful, pyruvate can get into the mitochondria and boom, now we can actually generate more ATP. But what happens if it's not present? Well, we get our two ATP molecules here, which is wonderful. But what can also happen is we can generate lactate. And when we have low oxygen, lactate will be formed. And some of you may be familiar with lactic acid buildup that causes soreness in muscles. But when we generate lactate, not all is lost. Because what will happen is we can convert, all right, uh, lactate back into a form of glucose. And we can do that in the liver. But pyruvate will be converted into lactate with our enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. And once we have lactate, now we can uh, ship lactate around the body into the blood system. Hopefully it will wind up back in the liver or even into the cardiac tissue, right, of the muscle there. And we can actually use lactate as fuel. Now that gets into the lactic acid cycle. Don't have to worry about that for 210, but for 211 you will. But with the lactic acid cycle, we are gonna undergo a process all right, in which we're going to take the lactate and convert it, all right, back into glucose. When that happens, all right, we're going to undergo the process of gluconeogenesis. We talked about that back in chapter two. Gluco, neo, neo being new, we're going to make new glucose from a non-sugar uh, um, uh, substance, okay? Once we have that glucose, now we can ship it back out to the muscle. So the body has several ways in which it tries to deal with uh, uh, um, a shortage. Uh, if there's a shortage of oxygen or oxygen insufficiency, uh, the lactic acid cycle is one way in which we can generate some glucose. All right. So when we were talking about those three systems that I was mentioning before, the, phos the phosphagen system, uh, glycolysis, and then our aerobic cellular process, I want you to think of different exercise forms in which you would utilize which system. Now, if you're only gonna need a little bit of energy for a short burst of time, right, anything less than 10 seconds, primarily gonna use the phosphagen system when we're transferring phosphate from ADP or from creatine phosphate to another ADP molecule. So an example of that would be like a 50 meter sprint. That's the straightaway on a track. Then you've got, all right, uh, the, if you have to use a little bit, if you're the time, the, the duration of the exercise or activity is going to be a little bit longer, all right, less than a minute, equivalent to about a 400 meter sprint, then, all right, we always start off here initially with the phosphate transfer system. Then we'll start to incorporate glycolysis. And glycolysis will last for a little bit, okay? Then if we get into uh, activity that's going to be longer than a minute, like running a marathon or a 1500 meter race, we're going to use all three systems. Primarily, though, we are going to use the best one, 
the most bang for your buck system, the aerobic cellular respiration process. That's when we're gonna involve the mitochondria there. So again, keep in mind, we're gonna use all three. Let me show you a little picture here of us on the track, right here for that brief little uh, sprint here, you're gonna use the phosphate system. Then if you're gonna go once around the track, all right, then you're going to utilize all right, uh, the phosphate transfer system and glycolysis. And then for the 1500 meter race, all right, that's about a mile, all right, you're gonna, you're gonna use all three systems, but primarily you'll use the aerobic cellular respiration uh, uh, system. All right, so keep that in mind. I mean, when we're dealing with all right, aerobic exercise, how do I know if I'm exercising aerobically? I tell patients all the time, or just anybody, is if you're able to talk, then you're going to be exercising aerobically. I, I, uh, when I was in college, I used to run uh, at night, and uh, it was a good way to take a break from studying. And a buddy and I, we used to run uh, three miles every night from 10.30 to 11. And we kept a really slow pace. Part of it was we just weren't in a hurry to go anywhere, but also the whole time we were talking. And so that was a good way, or that's a great way to exercise aerobically because one, it helps to burn off more fat because your body prefers fat, all right, as a preferential fuel source. Um, but also you're, gonna, you're, you're getting the most bang for your buck. So when you are engaging in aerobic cellular respiration, right, aerobic exercise, it's great because it's gonna help to raise the, your heart rate above that baseline, all right? There's different, we call it the target heart rate. We're looking for that target heart rate. We're gonna see improvement in both the respiratory and the cardiovascular system because you're gonna be enhancing that delivery of oxygen to all those tissues that you are exercising. And then finally, all right, we get greater intensity, which is always a bonus. It's always a plus. Very, very helpful in that regard there. So question, additional ATP is made immediately available in muscle tissue through which unique phosphate containing molecule? Hooray, creatine phosphate. This is another additional way to get that ATP made. What are the various means for making ATP available in a 1500 meter race? Well, we start off with that phosphogen system. All right, then we can undergo anaerobic cellular respiration, which is glycolysis. And then we uh, will go through the aerobic cellular respiration system. That is gonna be the utilization of the mitochondria with oxygen. And that is primarily what is used in that 1500 meter race. So after you do this 1500 meter race, right, you wanna take a rest. And partially because you need to recover. Well, part of that recovery includes what we call oxygen debt. So this is after you've just finished exercising and you want to restore your body back to how it was before you started the exercise. So we're going to need to replace all that oxygen that we just used. So this is when we're referring to the oxygen debt of uh, that period there, not so much a, a time limit per se, but when you are considering oxygen debt, how much oxygen do we need to replace the oxygen that we just used up for our, our 1500 meter race? So in addition to that, right, we have to slap oxygen back onto all the hemoglobin that's circulating in your blood that we use. And then we have to replenish the oxygen on the myoglobin molecule inside the muscle cell. Of course, we want to replace any of the glycogen, which is that stored glucose back in that muscle tissue. And then we want to make sure that if there's any ADP, all right, floating around the cell, we want to get that back into uh, ATP. So we're going to utilize that creatine phosphate and just our, our regular uh, phosphate transfer system, right, that biokinase there. And then, of course, if there's any lactic acid that's floating around, then we're going to ship it all the way back to the liver and then make some glucose through gluconeogenesis. So all that is going to be um, utilized for uh, with, during that oxygen debt there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about muscle fiber types. Now, this if you're into exercise physiology and what this is important stuff. All right. uh, any folks that are thinking about doing sports medicine should consider this. Folks that are professional athletes consider this because you have to 
figure out, all right, what kind of muscle fiber types you have and what predominates depending on um, what kind of activity that you're going to do. So when we talk about skeletal muscle fibers, we classify the fiber types using two uh, um, categories. One is the type of contraction that you're going to generate. And then the next is how we're going to supply that energy, that ATP, for these contractions. So let's start off and talk about the type of contraction that we're going to generate. Now, there's three considerations or three things that we take into consideration when we're talking about uh, the type of contraction. One is the power, the speed, and then how long the contraction. So when we're talking about power, usually the bigger the muscle, the more power you can generate. So we, can, we take into consideration the diameter. Larger muscle fibers can make a much more forceful and powerful contraction. All right, with speed and duration, we're going to be talking about this fellow right here. Remember myosin? Well, I refer to it as ATPase. And if you recall, ATPase is that enzyme all right, that is going to break down ATP into ADP in the inorganic phosphate. And that's going to be found on the myosin head. So when we talk about myosin ATPase, that's the enzyme that we're talking about. So when we're talking about speed and duration, we're going to take into consideration the type of myosin ATPase, how fast we can generate and keep generating or propagate our ACTION potential, and then also how quickly we are going to release calcium into the sarcoplasm. And then once it's released into the sarcoplasm, how quickly we can get it out. So that is, is based on the calcium uh, uh, ion pumps. So when we're discussing the calcium ion pumps, we're referring to the reuptake of the calcium from the sarcoplasm back into our sarcoplasmic reticulum. So now talking about the type of generation, we have two types. We have fast twitch muscle fibers and slow twitch muscle fibers. So think, fast twitch, they're going to do everything quick. So our myosin ATPase is going to be referred to as the fast variant. With the slow twitch muscle fibers, we'll have the slow variant. Uh, myosin ATPase. So fast switch muscle fibers can uh, generate a contraction much quicker after the stimulation. What's the stimulation of the muscle? When the motor neuron all right, releases all right, the action, uh, not the action potential, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, that's what we're talking about. That whole process of how and all the steps that follow all right, the release of the neurotransmitter, we talked about this, the EPP, how we generate our um, the end plate potential. Then we have to generate the action potential, not only that. Then, all right, we've got to open up all right, the, the calcium channels, release calcium in the sarcoplasm, then calcium has to go and move the troponin tropomyosin complex off of the myosin binding sites. So all of that has to occur, all right? So how quickly that occurs, all right, determines all right, if we're a fast or slow twitch. So fast twitch, they do that whole process quite quick. Thing is, fast twitch muscle fibers only contract for a short period of time. Not a problem, but it's just gonna have a, slow, uh, a shorter uh, period of contraction. But their contraction will be quite powerful. So fast twitch muscle fibers have greater power and speed compared to the slow twitch muscle fibers. And of course, like everything I just said, all right, how fast can we generate that action potential and propagate that action potential along the sarcolemma down the T-tubules and then release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the terminal cisterna into the sarcoplasm where our contractile proteins are. And after all that happens, how quickly we can clean up the mess that we just made with the calcium, how quickly we can get the calcium back out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the sarcoplasm, uh, not how quickly we can get calcium out of the sarcoplasm and back into the sarcoplasm particular. So fast twitch muscle fibers, just think, do all that quickly. Slow twitch does it all slow, slower, I should say. So that's the first uh, category for classification of muscle fiber types. The second is how we supply ATP to these muscle fibers. So we have oxidative and glycolytic muscle fibers. So I'm going to define those for you. 
by oxidative, also known as fatigue resistant, are going to use aerobic cellular respiration. So we should think, okay, if we're going to undergo aerobic cellular respiration, we need oxygen. And then that means what do we need oxygen for? We need oxygen to get the pyruvate into mitochondria. So that means we're going to need mitochondria. All right. So there's a couple of things I want you to take into consideration. Oxidative fibers are going to have a big blood supply, extensive capillaries. Why? Well, what is in the blood? Hemoglobin. Why do we need hemoglobin? Because hemoglobin has oxygen. So these muscle fibers are going to have a big blood supply or an extensive capillary network that's going to supply them with oxygen. So we can utilize that oxygen to get our pyruvates into the mitochondria. Hooray! And also, these cells are going to have a lot of myoglobin. What's myoglobin? That is the oxygen-carrying molecule in the actual muscle fibers. So these type of muscle fibers will look red primarily because of myoglobin. And these type of muscle fibers can generate contractions for long periods of time okay, because they have all this ATP to spend. And that's good. So these muscle fibers will be great for postural muscles because those are constantly contracting. All right, the other type of muscle fiber are the glycolytic fibers, also known as fatigable muscle fibers. So they're going to primarily utilize anaerobic cellular respiration, primarily being glycolysis. So these muscle fibers will have fewer capillaries and, and it, it will have fewer mitochondria, really don't need them as much, okay? Because we're not getting a lot of oxygen here because we're utilizing glycolysis, right? Won't have a lot of myoglobin. So they won't appear as red, all right? Um, and so we look at them and refer to them as white fibers, okay, because they do not have myoglobin. These folks will tire easily for long period if you're going to utilize them over long periods of time, which makes sense because we call them fatigable. So how does a fast twitch fiber differ from a slow twitch? There you go. Fast twitch fibers produce stronger contractions. They can initiate their contractions quicker following stimulation, and they're going to produce those, those contractions all right, for a shorter period of time. How does an oxidative fiber differ from a glycolytic fiber? Oxidative fibers are going to primarily use the aerobic cellular respiration, which means they need oxygen. So they are going to have all right, more capillaries, more mitochondria, more myoglobin. And because they have all that, it's tougher to make them tire. So they are considered fatigue resistant. All right, with the glycolytic fibers, we are going to primarily use anaerobic respiration. So because of that, all right, they will have high amounts of glycogen stores because they're primarily gonna use, all right, glycolysis to generate ATP. But unfortunately, Right, they will tire easier because they have a shorter or a period or amount of ATP being supplied. So now what we're going to do is we're going to combine all right, those two categories of classification into our three types of skeletal muscle fibers. The first type is the slow oxidative fibers, which we also call type 1. So they will have that slow ATPase, which means, all right, it just takes a little bit longer for us to break down ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. So the contractions are going to be a slower type, not as powerful. But the good news is, is because these are oxidative, that means they'll be great for endurance because we'll have a lot of ATP available because we primarily undergo aerobic cellular respiration. So when you're looking at these types of muscle fibers, all right, they will have a smaller uh, diameter. And therefore, if they have a smaller diameter, smaller muscle fiber, they will not generate as powerful of a contraction. All right, but they will be colored red, 
That means they have a decent amount of myoglobin there. And as you know, myoglobin is our oxygen supplier. And they can contract for longer periods of time, which is wonderful because that makes them uh, useful for endurance, also for postural fibers. Fast oxidative fibers are the type 2A. They're going to contain the fast variant of ATPAs. So the contractions for these type of fibers are going to be fast and powerful. They're going to primarily use that aerobic respiration, which is great, okay, because we'll have plenty of ATP, right? But right, the amount of oxygen that is delivered to these tissues will be less. They will have a light red appearance because they'll have myoglobin, but they won't have as much myoglobin as we saw, all right, with the slow oxidative fibers. Then finally, we have our fast glycolytic fibers, our type 2B. So again, fast ATPA's variant. We'll have fast and powerful contractions. These are going to be found uh, uh, most prevalently throughout the, uh, the muscles in the, in the body here. The type of contraction, because they are fast uh, variant, will, will be short. But all right, our ATP is not going to be as plentiful because these are glycolytic fibers. So we don't have the use of the mitochondria. So primarily, we're going to be utilizing glycolysis. So we won't get a lot of uh, uh, these types of contractions won't last very long. All right. So these muscle fibers are going to have a white appearance because they do not have that myoglobin and the mitochondria available. All right. So where do we find these muscle fibers? All right. Well, when we're looking at a muscle, we're going to see that a muscle is going to have a variation in the type of muscle fibers available. And it, and it varies. Genes primarily determine what type of muscle fibers and, and the percentage that you have throughout your body. Um, we can change some of that through you know, exercise and, and athletic training, but primarily your, your genes, mommy and daddy, have already determined uh, the variation in the proportions of the muscle fibers that you're going to have. All right, so we'll see, like for example, in the hands, we'll have a high percentage of the fast glycolytic fibers there. Speed, quickness, all right, back muscles, all right, to help you, like your low back muscles, the erector spinae muscles, all right, they're going to primarily be made up of slow oxidative fibers because they're going to be contracting quite a bit to help maintain posture. Now, when we're looking at long distance running, all right, folks that are going to be you know, if we're, we're checking out their fiber makeup and the muscles of their legs, right, we're going to see quite a bit of the slow oxidative fibers there for the endurance portion. Now, sprinters, they're going to have the fast glycolytic because they do not need to um, uh, have, maintain that high endurance for the ATP and whatnot. It works out great. Here you can see when we're looking at our muscle fibers here, you can see there's a variation of the different types. Okay, we have our slow oxidative, our fast glycolytic, and our fast oxidative. And this is just showing you, all right, an example of a muscle fascicle, and you can see the different uh, fiber types there. So which muscle fiber type primary composes muscles that maintain posture? Slow oxidative. All right, let's talk a little bit here about muscle tension. What is muscle tension, okay? So when a muscle contracts, it's gonna generate a force and that's what muscle tension is, all right? It is the tension um, that is generated when a muscle contracts. And so we measure that. You can see our little experiment here. We have a muscle and we have some electrodes there that we've attached to our muscle. And what we're going to do is the electrodes, they are going to mimic what the nerve does, and we're going to stimulate the muscle to contract. So you're going to learn a new term here called a muscle twitch. And if you look here in our little graph, a muscle twitch is going to be what happens once we stimulate the muscle, there, what happens to that muscle? It's going to be stimulation of the muscle, the muscle contracts, then it relaxes. That's basically what a twitch is. The definition is a single brief contraction period 
followed by relaxation period of skeletal muscle in response to a single, a single stimulation. So we're gonna get to a, a specific voltage, that minimum voltage that is going to trigger that muscle twitch. And so that minimum voltage is gonna be our threshold. And we already know that value, negative 65 millivolts. But we're gonna mess around now and show you some variations in that. So when we're looking at the twitch, Right? We see on our graph here, there's three periods. You have the latent period, you have the contraction period, and then you have the relaxation period. Right? And all of these periods follow a stimulus. Okay, So we're going to stimulate our muscle now. And whoops, going the wrong way. So, but if you notice, we stimulate our muscle on our picture here, it doesn't start to contract right away. So I push the button, shock the muscle, and then there's a brief period of time there, all right, that occurs before the muscle starts to shorten. And so that's the latent period. So we don't see any change in the length of the fiber. Basically, the latent period is what happens, right, between the, the uh, cross bridge formation and what occurs at the neuromuscular junction. So you, if you recall, all those steps that occur, the releasing of the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Now we have to generate that EPP. And if we make it to that threshold value, then we have to propagate that active potential along the sarcolemma. Then it has to trigger the opening of those voltage-sensitive calcium channels. And then that will trigger the release of calcium into the sarcoplasm. And that calcium will diffuse into the sarcoplasm and it will bind onto the troponin and it will trigger the movement of the tropomyosin off of the actin binding site, or excuse me, the myosin binding site, and we can get our cross bridge formation. So all that has to occur. Once we get the cross bridge formation, then we can start to change the muscle length. So that's what's going on in that latent period. Okay, that's that delay. Of course, then the contraction period is when all right, we start to get the cross bridge formation, those power strokes are occurring and we start to build tension in the muscle. Then we're done, we're no longer contracting and that's the relaxation period. This is when our muscle tension starts to decrease. It's highly dependent on a protein connectin. So we'll see during the relaxation period, we start to release all right, the cross bridges that we formed and then what else happens during the relaxation period? Well, calcium right, is getting pumped out of the sarcoplasm and it's going back into the sarcoplasm reticulum. So that's what happens with a muscle twitch. What events are occurring in a muscle that produces the different components of a muscle twitch? There you go, latent period, contraction period, and relaxation period. You need to know what is happening during these periods. I already told you what's going on in the latent period. You can see with the contraction period, we're just getting the power strokes, right? That cross bridge formation with our power uh, strokes. The thick and thin filaments are moving past each other. And then we're done with that. We're no longer having power strokes. We've disengaged our cross bridges and we're now in the relaxation period. We got to clean up our party, get calcium out of the sarcoplasm, back into the sarcoplasm in particular. All right, so now I would like to talk to you, that's a muscle twitch. Now I would like to talk to you about what happens when we start to increase the stimulus intensity. And we're gonna talk about this concept called motor unit recruitment. So I need to talk to you about what a motor unit is. All right, and I'll show you that in a moment. Well, let me just skip that and show you what a motor unit is first. Here's a motor unit, a motor unit is a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. That's what a motor unit is. You need to know that definition, a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it controls. That's our motor unit. We want a little bit more of a detailed explanation of what a motor unit is. Here you go. Motor neuron cells, right, are going to be transmitting that motor output signal from our central nervous system, brain or spinal cord. And these motor neurons can have axons that branch. So they can innervate multiple muscle fibers. But if you want the simple definition, single motor neuron and all the fibers it controls, that's a motor unit. 
and we're going to see this all right throughout the whole entire body here so let's go back to now what motor unit recruitment is so we have our muscle and we're going to stimulate it not once but we're going to do it many times and we're going to do it repeatedly and as we do it we're going to start turning up the voltage here and the more we turn up the voltage the more motor units we recruit to contract. And so this recruitment, we call that multiple motor unit summation. And so this is, for example, all right, when you go, I like this example about talking about lifting a pencil versus lifting a heavy suitcase. You're not gonna need, all right, to recruit as, as much or, or as many motor units all right picking up a pencil lighter okay but what you'll you will need to have more motor units when you're lifting up a suitcase so this is how we're going to generate this and we'll talk about that all right so when we go above a certain voltage we're going to see eventually we're going to recruit all the possible motor units in that muscle all right, so we're going to eventually reach what we call maximum contraction and we can keep turning up the voltage and we're not going to generate a, anything that's going to be stronger uh, or, or more powerful contraction i should say so basically when we're undergoing this re recruitment process we're going to start with the smallest and then wind up with the largest all right so as we start with the smaller smaller motor units, then we're gonna start, and if we need to generate a more powerful contraction, then we're gonna keep increasing the motor unit numbers that we're recruiting, and we'll get to the larger motor units at, near the end there. So that's what we're seeing here. Here's our muscle twitch. Okay, so we stimulate, here's our, our stimulus. So we hit that minimum uh, millivolt uh, value, and we get our muscle contraction. And so we get a muscle twitch, which is going to be contraction of the muscle followed by relaxation of the muscle. So now what happens is, what happens if we start to increase, all right, the voltage, and if we start to increase the frequency? So in a muscle twitch, right, our frequency is 10 stimuli per second. Now what happens if we go up to 20, let's say? So we're gonna talk about that, All right? So if we increase our stimulus frequency to 20 per second, instead of our 10 per second, we're not gonna be able to fully relax the muscle and e each time we stimulate it. So as that occurs, right, our contractile forces are going to start to pile up on one another and we're gonna to start to produce right? More muscle tension. That's what we're seeing here. When we're talking about wave summation, see, we're not allowing our muscle to relax like we did with the muscle twitch. You can see here we've contracted the muscle and then here we're relaxing the muscle. So, you know, I, I say what goes up must come down. Well, what's going on here is we're going up, but we're not coming all the way back down. And by the time we start to come down a little bit, then we stimulate the muscle again and it shoots up even further. All right, on the left side of our graph here, on our y-axis, we have our muscle tension. So you can see we're not giving our muscle enough time to relax, then we stimulate it again, and now we generate even more muscle tension. So that's called wave summation. Now, when we talk about some of you may have heard of tetany or tetanus, you know, when you've stepped on a rusty nail, right, you've heard of the uh, uh, bacteria called Clostridium tetani, and I've talked about it before, All right? Well, tetany is when we're going to get these muscle contractions, all right, that are going to eventually be, we're getting our stimulus being so, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Right? We're getting our muscle stimulus coming at a frequency that is quite high, right, and we're gonna pretty much start to sustain uh, a muscle contraction continuously. Now, what we're seeing is, all right, with incomplete tetany, right, we can still increase the, 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 the amount of tension that's occurring, 
But what we're seeing now is these muscle contractions are almost going to be like one long sustained contraction. But we'll see just a little bit of a relaxation and then a quick contraction there. Right, so that's what we're seeing with incomplete tetany. When we get to tetany, right now, it's like a muscle that will not stop contracting. So we've increased the frequency of stimulation so much, right? Now what we're seeing is one long muscle contraction or a muscle tension is just so continuous, right? We're not getting any relaxation. And then we keep turning up the dial on the, on the, uh, um, on the voltage, whoops. And eventually the muscle will fatigue because we've used up all the energy. No more ATP in our muscle. And so it just falls off. So if you look down here at the bottom, you can see how we've just gradually turned up the frequency of the stimuli. Keep turning it up, keep turning it up. All right now we're getting the muscle, it's contracting, but it's not fully relaxing. And then every time it contracts again, it builds more muscle tension because we're recruiting more muscle motor units. And then eventually we start to enter into incomplete tetany where you'll see just a slight little bit of, of where the muscle tension drops off slightly, All right. um, but not enough to get into the relaxation. And then eventually we'll get to tetany, which is it's one, you can see it, it's a nice smooth line here on our graph, right? And it looks like one sustained contraction the whole time. Problem is, when the muscle is contracting for that duration of time, it's burning through all that ATP. Eventually it uses up all the ATP and the muscle fatigues and um, you, will, you will no longer have a muscle contraction. <clears throat> all right, so when we're talking about motor units, just I didn't cover this uh, what we, when I was discussing what a motor unit was, the size of the motor unit, all right, is going to determine the degree of control of that motor unit. So when we're looking at smaller motor units, all right, we're going to see all right, those in smaller muscle fibers, all right, and then what they'll be doing is um, you'll see a, in smaller motor units a larger amount of control versus what a, a larger motor unit has. So we see that inverse relationship again the, between the size of the motor units and um, the degree of control. So smaller motor units are going to have greater control. So we'll see them in a much more fine muscle movement areas like your eye or your hands. right? But like your legs, your quads, you'll see the larger motor units. Right? They won't have as precise control, which is fine, okay? Um, but they will be able to uh, generate more power. All right, this is just a quick review of the neuromuscular junction. Keep in mind, this is where we're going to see where our motor neuron is going to come in close contact with our muscle fiber. And usually we'll see this in this mid middle area of our muscle fiber. And when we're discussing what the neuromuscular junction is, we're including all right, the synaptic knobs, the synaptic cleft, and then the motor end plate on the muscle tissue. All right, this picture here is just showing you what happens. I love it because it's showing you, all right, when we start to increase, all right, our voltage here, what we'll see is we'll start to, the more voltage that we're generating, we're going to start to increase the amount of muscle tension that we're generating. And the graph below here, you can see the muscle fibers being recruited more. So if we're looking um, at both of these graphs here, you'll see, right, with uh, this lower voltage, we'll see a little bit of a muscle twitch and you can see, all right, we've got two muscle fibers being uh, recruited. Now we increase the voltage we'll get a little bit more muscle tension because now we're starting to stimulate more muscle fibers. Keep increasing, increasing the voltage, more muscle fibers are being recruited. Eventually, we're gonna recruit all the muscle fibers. And we can turn the volts, we can keep turning the voltage up, but we're not gonna recruit any more muscle fibers because we've recruited all of them. So I don't know if you've ever been around or uh, noticed, uh, 
someone say to somebody else or someone mention to you, you know, wow, you should get a massage because your muscles are really tight. All right. This happens all the time. And when people are referring to, or they might tell uh, their doctor or their trainer or their physical therapist, you know, I hear patients tell me all the time, oh, I'm tight. You know, I've never really been flexible. When they're talking about their tightness, they're referring to what, what is known as muscle tone, right? That's basically, right, how your muscles are feeling physically when they're not actually doing anything, when you're not actively using them. And that's because your nervous system, well, every once in a while, I shouldn't say every once in a while, but your nervous system without your, uh, um, I guess you could say permission, but without voluntary control will involuntarily stimulate muscle. And so this will happen randomly. Right now, obviously, when you're sleeping, this will not happen as much. So if you really want to get a good sense of your overall muscle tone, um, you can find out when you're sleeping, I mean, you can't tell, but if someone were to, I know it's going to sound weird, but if someone were to palpate uh, your muscles and feel the tone without waking you up, they'll mostly notice that you're not going to have very tight muscles because at the time of rest, right, the nervous system will not be stimulating those muscles as much. All right. So there's different types of contractions, all right? All this time we've talked about muscle contractions and what's happening, but I haven't really described to you the different types of contractions. So we have isometric contractions and isotonic contractions. Think of this, isometric, the length of the muscle does not change. It stays the same, all right? But you're going to still generate tension on the muscle. So the length of the muscle stays the same, but tension is being generated, right? And the length of the muscle will not get shorter or longer because we've heard me talk about when we're dealing with muscle contractions, usually up until this point, we all think, oh, muscle shortens, okay? Well, in certain types of muscle contractions, the muscle can lengthen. And that leads me into the next type of muscle contractions in which those are called isotonic contractions. So what happens is the muscle will contract, it generates muscle tension, right? And it overcomes the resistance. So what does that mean, all right, when it overcomes the resistance and it results in movement? You know, when you go to pick something up, okay, the weight of whatever it is that you're going to pick up is gonna offer resistance. So if you are able to move whatever it is that you're trying to pick up, right? If you move it, you're overcoming that resistance. So in this case, we're going to see a change in the length of the muscle. So there's two types of isotonic contractions. You have concentric contractions and eccentric contractions. With the concentric contraction, right, the muscle's length shortens. With an eccentric contraction, the muscle lengthens. So the example here is the biceps brachii. Okay, if you're going to bend your elbow and flex your elbow, the biceps brachii is going to contract. When you go, I mean, it's going to shorten during contraction. When you undergo eccentric contraction, the biceps brachii, when, when I ask you, okay, you've now bent your elbow, now please straighten your elbow out. When you go to straighten your elbow out, all right, the biceps brachii is going to contract, but it's going to lengthen. So like when you go to bring uh, a cup to your mouth to drink some liquid, all right, obviously when you're doing that, the biceps brachii is contracting, Right, you're overcoming the resistance of the load of the of the weight of the cup. Right, you take your drink and then you go to lower it back down and put it back down on the table or whatever um, surface you're placing the cup down. You're still um, overcoming the resistance of the cup, all right, because you are moving it. But when you go to lower it back down onto the table, okay, you are lengthening the muscle, but it is still generating a force. So when you attempt to shovel snow. All right, excuse me. When you attempt to shovel a load of snow that is too heavy, what sort of muscle contraction are you using? All right, this again is tough to uh, uh, put into perspective for some of us, especially if we're living in the Southeast, all right, because you might not have ever seen snow, all right? But I'm from the North and when I have shoveled snow, uh, there's been a few times when I have tried to move a load of snow and I stuck my shovel into the pile of snow and I started to lift up on it 
shovel's not moving, but my muscles are contracting. That is an isometric contraction because the generation of the muscle tension that I'm creating is not enough to overcome the load, the resistance of the snow. All right, this is showing you a great example of the differences between isometric contraction and isotonic contraction. Baby was crying, all right, the father goes in to get the baby out of the crib and he pulls the baby and comforts the baby against his cheek here. As he's holding the baby, the weight of the baby is the resistance, all right? But in this picture here, you can see the baby's not moving. The dad's arm isn't moving, okay? But he still is contracting his biceps brachii to hold the baby against his cheek there, all right? So the muscle tension will be less than the resistance, right? Because, and so if it's less than resistance, no movement is going to occur. Now, when the baby, when the father went to pick the baby up out of the crib, right, he's undergoing a concentric muscle contraction of the biceps brachii. As he's moving the baby towards his face, he is generating enough muscle tension to overcome the resistance, the weight of the baby. And so he pulls the baby towards his face. The, his biceps brachii is uh, shortening. Uh, and so now the baby's fine. Time to put the baby back down into the crib. Good night, baby. All right. Dad starts to lower the baby back down into the crib. The biceps brachii is still generating uh, 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 muscle tension. And it's enough to overcome the weight of the baby, all right, the resistance. And so as he's lowering the baby back down in the crib, he's, you can see that the um, biceps brachii is lengthening. So an important thing that folks don't really under, you know, think about too much is when we're discussing sustained isometric contractions, it can play a role in blood pressure. And one of the things that uh, we hear all the time, especially up in my area, when I used to live up in upstate New York, was if you're going out to shovel snow, um, you have to be careful uh, if you have a heart condition. And the reason why is because when you go out to shovel snow, okay, um, and if you are gonna be straining to go in, in and shovel the snow, uh, you can increase your blood pressure. And so what we've learned is with isometric, sustained isometric contractions, we can have an increase in blood pressure and that could be bad, especially for folks that have heart issues. Also, when you're out there shoveling, all right, the cold is going to cause peripheral constriction of blood vessels in your skin. We talked about that with thermoregulation, right? Those blood vessels will vasoconstrict and shunt blood away from the skin to help conserve heat and keep it close to your uh, internal organs. Part of the problem is when you get constriction, you increase what we call TPR, total peripheral resistance. And that is one of the factors that determines blood pressure. Blood pressure is calculated by the total peripheral resistance and you multiply that by your heart rate. So obviously when you're doing exercise, your heart rate will increase. Now you're adding cold to that and you're increasing the total peripheral resistance. You're going to increase your blood pressure. And so that can be a problem. All right, so talking about the uh, contractions and, and, and uh, concentric contractions versus um, uh, eccentric contractions, we're talking about the changing of the, the muscle fibers, lengthening and shortening. We need to talk about the length tension relationship. And so basically when we're talking about the length tension relationship, we're going to talk about how much tension all right, force a muscle can generate, all right, and how it's dependent on the length of the muscle fiber at the time of stimulation. So we found out, we've done a bunch of, uh, of experiments, and we found out that, all right, we've tried uh, three different types of, of scenarios here. Resting length versus a shortened length versus an extended length of the sarcomere or the muscle fibers. So we found out that a resting length is the optimal or the best length for a muscle to
to be at to generate the most power. And the reason why is simple. That's where we're going to see, all right, the best type of overlap between the thick and thin filaments. So if you look here, when we're looking at the resting length, here's our sarcomere, there's a decent amount of overlap. Now, when we look here, when we've lengthened our muscle and stretched it out, look, there's hardly any overlap between the thick and thin filament. So we're not gonna generate a lot of tension. Conversely, when we shorten the muscle as much as we can, look, we yeah, we have a lot of overlap here, but guess what? There's no room to move. So it's almost like Goldilocks, you know, too hot versus too cold, you know, too soft versus too firm, right? We found just in the middle at the resting length, we get plenty of room to move and we also have overlap, optimal overlap, so we can generate our force. If you see here, okay, we can generate quite a bit of force with the resting length. When we're at a shortened uh, length of our sarcomere, we're not able to generate as much force. Same when we've uh, lengthened our, our muscle fiber and there's hardly any overlap we see that we can't generate as much power. In which muscle length can a muscle generate the most tension? Contracted, resting length, or stretched? And why does this happen? Well, resting length. Optimal overlap between the thick and thin filaments. All right, so when we've done all of our, of our uh, uh, um, uh, contractions and, and whatnot, we're eventually going to reach what we call muscle fatigue. And when this occurs, what we're going to see is, all right, we produced our muscle tension and we've, and we've utilized, all right, as much of the contractile force as we can. Now we're going to see we've reduced the ability to generate any muscle tension. And that's primarily going to be because where's our energy, all right? ATP has gone, all right? So for the most part, all right, primarily the cause of muscle fatigue is going to be, we've gotten rid of our, 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 our energy supply, all right, we used up all the glycogen that's been stored in the muscle, all right, and yeah, we're able to get some, all right, from, the, from our blood and whatnot, but some other causes for muscle fatigue could be what happens at the neuromuscular junction. We're not getting enough calcium that's entering into the synaptic knob, okay, if you're hypocalcemic, if you have decreased calcium levels, right, that's going to be a problem because then you're not going to be able to release as much acetylcholine from the synaptic vesicles because we don't have enough calcium to stimulate the movement of those synaptic vesicles towards the synaptic clot. Also, when we're dealing with, all right, the second physiological uh, event, in a muscle contraction, the excitation contraction, contraction coupling, right, where we start to get the flow of sodium into the cell and potassium out of the cell. If you have, all right, issues with the amount of ions that are available to you, that can then cause a problem with the generation and conduction of an action potential. And then that will also cause issues with calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. One of the other things too is with our cross bridge cycling, right, if we have too much inorganic phosphate lying around inside the sarcoplasm, right, it will start to accumulate and make it much more difficult for the cross bridge formation to occur. And so we'll, and so what we'll see is, all right, less cross bridging, less muscle tension being generated. And also that decreased calcium that we have from the inner, from our hypocalcemia, we won't be able to move the troponin tropomyosin complex off of those binding sites. So there's lots of problems, lots of issues going on, which brings me to exercise, love exercise. Exercise is good for you. It will help, all right, your muscles. You know the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it, all right? So when exercising is occurring, if you're in some program, you're working with a trainer or you do a specific sport in which they train you, all right, for a specific type of activity, all right, 
we're going to see that that type of training is going to influence the type of what happens to your muscles, right? For example, uh, cross country runners, endurance exercise, we're going to see, all right, more ATP being produced because if we're undergoing endurance exercises, Oh, there it is. I couldn't find my cursor there. I apologize. And it was bothering me. All right. Um, we're going to see more ATP because the more ATP that's being produced because you're starting to uh, stimulate the increase in mitochondria in that muscle will generate more ATP through aerobic cellular respiration. All right. Folks that like to train for um, uh, bodybuilding, for example, that do resistance training, they're going to see an increase in the size of their muscles. And we call that increase in tissue size hypertrophy. And this is because their body is now going to make more actin and myosin proteins, more myofilaments are going to be made. We'll also see more glycogen and more mitochondria being available. And in some situations, now remember, I know I said this before, all right, muscle tissue normally, or skeletal muscle tissue undergoes hypertrophy, but in some cases it will undergo hyperplasia. Remember, hypertrophy is an increase in the tissue size, but hyperplasia is an increase in the cell number, All right? In this case, we'll see more muscle fibers being generated. All right, so we know what happens when we get exercise. What happens if we do no activity, All right? That brings in atrophy, all right? Well, commonly known as disuse atrophy. When you, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. Well, that's what happens here, okay? We'll see a decrease in the muscle size because we're not using it. A uh, person that is in a coma in bed, uh, if they're not uh, getting enough activity, all right, their muscles will start to atrophy. It happened to me when I had a cast, all right? I broke my leg in the fourth grade. My calf muscle uh, significantly decreased. Now, if it is long-term, it can become permanent. Most of the time with atrophy, it is reversible. Problem is if it becomes permanent, all right, the muscle tissue gets replaced with connective tissue. And that's, and if you're replacing muscle tissue with connective tissue, well, connective tissue isn't, um, well, when I should be more specific. Um, that connective tissue that replaces the muscle tissue is fibrous connective tissue. It's not contractile whatsoever. So you'll see a decrease in muscle tone and a decrease in the power that you can generate from contraction. So like I, I've said in the past, um, at the end of the chapter, we will talk about the effects of aging on this tissue. And what we see is, right, as we age, usually by our third decade in life, you will start to lose muscle mass. And it's roughly about 10% per decade a loss of muscle mass. So, but again, it, it varies from person to person, right? But it really depends on, golly, I keep losing that cursor. That will usually be because you have a decrease in activity. And if you have a decrease in activity, you decrease muscle mass, all right? You'll see a decrease in the size, the amount of contraction. And if there's, uh, if it's an endurance muscle, Again, you'll see a decrease in the amount of endurance fibers there. All right. All right. So what is the term for an increase in skeletal muscle fiber size resulting from repetitive stimulation of skeletal muscle fibers? That's going to be hypertrophy. Um, blah, blah, blah. Effects of aging here, All right? Continuing on, we'll see a decrease. I should mention this, All right? In a number of satellite cells. The decrease in satellite cells, remember, they're a support cell. So they help if muscle fibers become damaged, these satellite cells can help repair that damage. But if we see a decrease in the number of satellite cells, well, then their support role has then be, become diminished. And this is what I was talking about earlier, all right? If that um, muscle tissue uh, through the atrophy uh, becomes permanent, that muscle tissue gets replaced by the dense regular connective tissue all right, that fibrotic tissue, it does not have, all right, that uh, the properties of muscle tissue, which was elasticity, all right, so if it loses its elasticity because it's now 
having fewer muscle fibers, but more uh, uh, fibro fibrotic uh, tissue available, we'll see a decrease in flexibility. And therefore that can impact um, on movement there. All right, which leads me into steroids. Everybody every semester asks me about anabolic steroids, you know, and other performance enhancing uh, drugs, but anabolic steroids, all right, are going to uh, mimic uh, our androgens, which uh, are the male hormones, your sex hormones, testosterone. And what we'll see is, all right, these anabolic steroids are going to help create those contractile proteins. And unfortunately, all right, yes, they can increase muscle strength, muscle speed, muscle power, but it's the side effects that far outweigh the benefits, especially if uh, steroid abuse occurs because, right, no joke, it does increase heart disease, but most importantly, stroke. I watched a video uh, where this guy was big into um, not bodybuilding, but competitive uh, uh, resistance training. And he would compete for uh, the bench press. And this guy took steroids, abused the steroids, got uh, blood clots in his legs, had both of his legs amputated. He says, well, the positive out of that was it dropped him down significantly into a lower weight class so he could compete against people. He continued the steroid abuse. And... Um, I, never, I don't remember if he died or whatnot, but I would figure at that point that if you lost your legs because you had blood clots and it destroyed the circulatory system in your legs and the tissues there, that you would stop abusing the, uh, the um, steroids, but he didn't. Um, worse, it can cause issues with your liver okay, and the kidneys. In males, you'll get testicular atrophy because you're... you're uh, um, um, the, the testes are no longer going to be uh, generating enough testosterone because you're taking it, you're supplementing it. So they no longer have to uh, generate testosterone. So they shrink in size. And in males, you can get what's called gynecomastia, which is men can start to develop breasts. Um, acne, increase, significant increase in blood pressure. And then of course, aggressive behavior, not a good thing. So what are some of the changes in the skeletal muscle accompanying aging? There you go. Decreased muscle mass with the loss of fiber number and diameter, decreased oxygen storage capacity, decreased muscle strength and endurance, decreased circulatory supply. The list goes on and on and on. All right, so quite a few changes occur. All right, I'm gonna stop here for this video and then we can pick up in the next video, the rest of chapter 10.